Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace. I'm Janet Peterson, and this is my husband, Mark, and our baby, Nate, who some of you got to meet many months ago. Um, we wanted to give a special welcome um, to our pastor today, Blair, who's visiting, and this is her first time um, preaching at Grace, which I couldn't believe, but we're so glad that we get to be here for that. We also want to give a special welcome to those who are visiting um, over the internet today who may not have joined our service before. We are so glad that you're with us and encourage you to connect with us and other events throughout the week. Um, we'd like to invite you to a virtual new visitors gathering. That's going to be Sunday, September 6th, about who we are as Grace Church, what we believe, how you can get involved, and any questions that you might have, um, they'll be prepared to answer. To register for this event, there is a link in the comment section, um, so you can comment and, and get connected there. We're also still welcoming sign-ups for our feminism for our feminism and faith study. If you're interested in joining this class, um, please email Senior Pastor Jonathan about that. Finally, the anti-racism film discussion um, on the film The 13th, which is an excellent, excellent um, production. Highly encourage you all to watch it even if you can't partake in the study. The study will take place on Tuesday, August 25th at 7 p.m., and you can watch the film uh, and then join the discussion. You can register for that event also by clicking on the link or going to the church website. Um, let's now turn our hearts and minds to God as we worship together this day. join me in the call to worship. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I give thanks to your name, 
for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. So I walk in the midst of trouble. You preserve me. You stretch out your hand and you deliver me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the will of your hands. And now will you please join in the hymn, One Bread, One Body. You can find it in the bulletin. Um, You can find it also in your hymnal, 620. Well, at this time, uh, it's a tradition, but we still try to keep it going and passing the peace and offer some reflection in the midst of that. And so one thing I was thinking of is, where has God brought laughter into your life recently? Um, For me, it would probably be uh, Friday night at our house, pizza night. We had a, a great pizza, and it was awesome. And there was a little bit of laughter after people were not too badly injured. Um, I pulled my left calf, and Blair had some minor burns on her hand. But it was something we could look back at, and I think it's okay to laugh now. So what has God brought laughter in what form to you in ways that don't harm one another? Um, 
and me physically. Let us pass peace now. scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Grace Church. I am so honored and grateful for the opportunity to share a message with you this morning. And I want to say a few things before I begin. And the first is thank you. Thank you for the ways you have walked alongside me and Adam these past six years. Uh, You have been the church to us uh, by being a means of grace. And I want you to hear that. You are a means of grace. You are a way through which Adam and I have experienced God's unconditional love as we have navigated the ups and downs of life. You have been there for us every step of the way, and we are so grateful. Second, I'm able to be here today because I am no longer a local church pastor, so I guess you could say I have a little more free time on Sunday mornings uh, than I have in quite some time. My new position is with the Texas Methodist Foundation as the Director of Leadership Ministry. And what that means, in part, is that I get to look at the church from a 30,000-foot view. And, And what I want you to know is when I look at the landscape of congregations in America, you, you don't have to be in the church leadership business to get this, uh, by the way, but, but the picture isn't exactly pretty. Are you with me? But when I look at Grace Church, well, you give me hope. You give me hope. You really do. You are focused on mission, how you have been, and you continue to stand up to the status quo for the sake of the gospel, the ways that you create space for authentic community. Keep being you, Grace Church. Keep being you. Uh, You are showing the world what it means to be the body of Christ, which is actually a good segue to our sermon today. How about that? So, um, So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for your leadership and for the invitation to preach today. Let's pray. 
Lord, open us up. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Open our hearts to feel. And then, O oh God, open our hands to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I don't usually do this, but I am going to give you an outline of the sermon today. I'm just putting it all out there at the beginning so you have a map for where we are going because there may be a moment when you go, now where the heck is she going with this? And I want you to stay with me, Grace Church. Stay with me. We are going somewhere. We are going somewhere. So here is where we are going. There are three parts and one question to this sermon. The first part, I am going to show you this overarching pattern of the Bible in about three minutes. I know, you didn't see that coming, right? All right, so uh, I want you to see this pattern, which is this major theme of the entire scripture. That is part one. In part two, we are going to explore how Paul, in our text today from the letter to the Romans, he takes this theme and he runs with it, and and in a very Paul-like way, pushes us even more. And part three is application. God's word for us today. There is a word God has for us today. Are you with me? How about an amen in the Facebook chat, if that's where you're, you're watching us today? I encourage you to share your comments, your questions, reactions, emojis. Feel free to do a little talk back in the chat today, Grace Church. So, there you have it. You have your three parts. And here is the question I want you to keep in your mind throughout the sermon today. Will you allow the grace of God to remake you and reorder your life? Will you allow the grace of God to remake you and reorder your life? So here we go, part one. There is this pattern throughout the Bible, order, disorder, and reorder. And no, I did not come up with this. Uh, the, The great teacher, Richard Rohr, says, that the biblical pattern mirrors the pattern in our lives. And and it's the journey we must go through if we are to become fully alive, to live as we were made to live. So there's order. Order. Everything is in its proper place. There are laws, traditions, customs, boundaries. And it gives us the structure we need to feel safe and in control. But to grow toward love, union, salvation, we must be moved from order to disorder. So something happens. Uh, There's a loss, a tragedy. We experience pain and suffering, and our normal way of thinking and being in the world is disrupted. We realize that this ordered container we had nicely put together, was so nicely put together, it doesn't work for us anymore. We are ready for reorder. We're ready to be remade. We are ready for a new way of seeing and being in the world. And what happens when we move from disorder to reorder is we start to see that paradox is okay. That death is a part of life. That imperfection is part of perfection. Weakness is strength. Everything belongs. Everybody belongs. And our capacity for compassion and forgiveness and patience increases. We deeply know and believe that that we are beloved and so is everyone else. So what, what do you think? What do you think about order, disorder, reorder? What do you think about this pattern? Do you see it? As a country, as a church, we are in this very rare time, rare time when we are experiencing disorder together, right? So so there is this invitation before us to be reordered, to be remade. But we could also just go back to the way things were. Will will we go back to the order we know? Or, Or will this be a turning point for us in which we allow the grace of God to remake us and reorder our lives? We see this pattern of order, disorder, reorder clearly in the Old Testament with the story of the Israelites. The Israelites are slaves in Egypt, and and they know a certain kind of order. 
the way Pharaoh has ordered the world, where he is on top of this literal and figurative power pyramid, and everyone else is below him. God hears the cries of the Israelites, and God sets them free from this oppressive order. But, and this is the part I don't want you to miss, God doesn't just want the Israelites to go to the promised land and create another Pharaoh-type society. When they get there, God doesn't want that. God doesn't want them to order the world in the old way. God doesn't want a society of haves and have-nots. God wants shalom, where everyone has what they need and can thrive. So as, as one of my favorite scholars puts it, God gets the people out of slavery And then God has to get the slavery out of the people. So God sends the Israelites into a time of disorder, 40 years in the wilderness. You could call it wilderness school, by the way. Wilderness school where they learn a new way of being and relating to each other. But spoiler alert, they fail at wilderness school. They fail. They they don't get it. And when they get to the promised land... They order the society in the way that they know, the Pharaoh way, which is our tendency as human beings, isn't it? It is easier to go back to the way things were, even if we suspect that the way things were wasn't really that great. Are you with me? I mean, can we just go back to the way things were before the pandemic? I mean, can, everything was better in our country and our church back then, right? Let's, let's just go back to the way it used to be. God doesn't give up on the Israelites, by the way. God sends prophets to help them to see how the order that they are living in isn't working and to imagine how to reorder the world in a way that is more equitable and more in line with the world God imagines. But they don't listen. They don't listen. So God decides to come to earth in human form as Jesus the Christ, and Jesus shows us a new order. He calls it the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, there is good news for the poor and freedom for the oppressed and the blind can see and the lame can walk and sinners are forgiven and justice and righteousness, not greed and power, rule the day. Jesus completely reorders the world. He says, blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are those who mourn and blessed are the poor in spirit. And Jesus lives out this whole new pattern for us so that we can see it. He goes from life to death to life again. He goes through death to life again. He is raised from the dead, the ultimate reordering of the universe. This is our journey of transformation, too. Our journey of spiritual growth. We go from order to disorder to reorder. If we allow God to remake us and reorder our life, will you allow God to remake you and reorder your life? Or will you stay stuck in the old, ordered ways? Will we stay stuck in our old, ordered ways, church? There is another way. There's another path before us. Part two. Part two. The church in Rome is at this crossroads, and Paul knows it. They're either going to conform to the old ways of the world, how the world is ordered, or they're going to renew their minds in Christ and reorder things according to Christ. And there are two groups in this early church in Rome. You have the Christian Gentiles and the Christian Jews, and the old way of ordering themselves would be for each group to think the other is less than. You follow me? So the old way of thinking would be for the Jews to think, you know, the gospel is really just for us, not for them. And for the Gentiles to think, you know, the gospel is really for us and not for them. And this is where Paul pushes us a little more because he doesn't just call this out as stinking thinking, which it is. He calls it out as, are you ready for this? Sin. Sin. Sin, to Paul, is this powerful force that tries to keep us captive in the old ways of thinking and being in the world. So sin, you know, sin isn't 
so much cussing and dancing, maybe as you learn growing up, that's a pretty narrow way of looking at it, really. Sin is this mindset. Sin is the way you view yourself and others. Do not be conformed by this world, Paul says, but be transformed. By what? By the renewing of your minds. You see how this reordering happens inside of you first? It starts on the inside. That's why Paul says, pray without ceasing. He wants your mind and your heart completely and constantly focused on God, on talking with God, so that you may discern what is the will of God. So that God can reorder, renew your mind, so that your decisions, your outward way of being, flows from that inner transformation that is constantly taking place. Notice, by the way, that Paul does not say, transform yourself. Paul says, be transformed. God does the transforming, but we do have to consent to it. We have to say, yes, will you allow God to remake you and reorder your life? Here's an image that I heard a long time ago, but it has stayed with me all these years. A a pastor in a church in San Francisco came into the sanctuary on a weekday morning and found a homeless man uh, in in the sanctuary. He had gathered up the, the altar cloth, and he was asleep on the altar on the altar. He was asleep. And, and the pastor said that, that he was offended at first. He was like appalled that this man was asleep on the altar. But then, then this verse just came to his mind. Present yourselves as a holy and living sacrifice. Paul is saying the old ordered way is animal sacrifices and grain offerings The new, the reordered way is we offer ourselves to God, our whole selves, mind, heart, body. What happens when you say yes to allowing God to remake you and reorder your life is that your life becomes not about you. You become about life, about God's will for your life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God. Part three. Paul says when our minds are renewed, when they are remade, that there are two things that happen. First, we think with sober judgment about ourselves. I don't know about you, but I would rather think with sober judgment about other people. I know that you, as a congregation, you have studied White Fragility by Robin DeAngelo. I will tell you that I find myself rereading it often these days. Here is some sober judgment she offers. She says, I believe that white progressives cause the most daily damage to people of color. I define a white progressive as any white person who thinks he or she is not racist, or is less racist, or in the choir, or already gets it. White progressives can be the most difficult for people of color because to the degree that we think we have arrived, we will put our energy into making sure that others see us as having arrived. None of our energy will go into what we need to be doing for the rest of our lives, engaging in ongoing self-awareness, continuing education, relationship building, and actual anti-racist practice. White progressives do indeed uphold and perpetuate racism, but our defensiveness and certitude make it virtually impossible to explain to us how we do so. Whew. Whew. I mean, I will tell you, that hits me. Sober judgment is the first step of renewing our minds. And the second is to see that we are one in the body of Christ, and individually we are members one of another. Racism is this old order. And as historians point out, racist ideas have defined our society and our church. Ibram Kendi says this, 
We have no patterns for relating across our human differences as equals. To be an anti-racist is a radical choice in the face of this history, requiring a radical reorientation of our consciousness. A radical reorientation of our consciousness. A reordering of the world where there is a new pattern for relating across human differences as equals. We know what this pattern looks like. We know this, church. The new pattern is the body of Christ. The body of Christ. We who are many are one in the body of Christ. Individually, we are members one of another. We can relate to one another across our differences because there is no us and them in the body. It is all us. As Paul says, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, gay or straight, black or white, Democrat or Republican, Longhorn or Sooner, for you are all one in the body of Christ. Okay, I took some liberties on that quote. But the point is, We have our differences, but we are one in Christ Jesus, and we need one another to be the body of Christ in the world. Do you know what the hallmark of the recorded, the reordered life is? How you can tell, how you can tell if someone or a whole group of people has said yes to allow God to reorder them? It is knowing you are chosen by God, and so is everyone else, that everyone else is chosen too. It is the capacity to see the chosenness of everyone. And that's why I have real hope for the United Methodist Church. If you look at our history, what do you see? A pattern of order, disorder, and in the reordering, we draw the circle wider every time. That's why I'm standing here today as an ordained pastor, because about 60 years ago, out of disorder came a new order that women can preach and lead. And now, out of the current disorder by God's grace, we will reorder our church to be fully inclusive so that we will be led by our LGBTQ plus siblings into our new future. And what happens when you get a whole group of people who say, yes, yes, God, you can reorder us. What happens is the world changes for the better. Also, that is a church that is literally out of control. John Wesley said it well in his covenant prayer. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Do you hear the out of controlness in that statement? I'm yours. I'm part of your body on this earth, your will, not mine. If you want God to reorder your life, pray that prayer every morning before you get out of bed. When we go from order to reorder, we give ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, and we let go of control. Grace Church, I want you to be disciples who are out of control. I mean that. I really do. Like, I want you to be a part of the church of the out of control. So I want to end with this Magna Carta of an out of control disciple by Leonard Sweet, which for me describes the reordered life. I am part of the church of the out of control. I once was a control junkie, but now I am an out-of-control disciple. I've given up my control to God. I trust and obey the Spirit. I've jumped off the fence. I've stepped over the line. I've pulled out all the stops. I'm holding nothing back. There's no turning back, looking around, slowing down, backing away, letting up, or shutting up. It's life played without goal lines other than, Thy will be done. I can't be bought by any personalities or perks, positions, or prizes. I won't give up, though I will give in to openness of mind, humbleness of heart, and generosity of spirit. When short-handed and hard-pressed, I will never again hang in there. 
I will stand in there. I will run in there. I will pray in there. I will sacrifice in there. In fact, I will do everything in there but hang. My face is upward. My feet are forward. My eyes are focused. My way is cloudy. My knees are worn. My feet uncreased. My heart unburdened. My spirit light. My road narrow, my mission wide, my fundamental identity is as a disciple of Jesus, but even more, as a disciple of Jesus who doesn't walk through history simply in his steps, but seeks to travel more deeply in his spirit. Until he comes again or calls me home, you can find me filling, not killing time, so that one day when he picks me out of the lineup of the ages as one of his own, and then it will be worth it all to hear these words, most precious words I can ever hear. Well done, thou good and faithful, out of control disciple. Yes, those are words I long to hear too. But I know that if I'm going to be an out-of-control disciple, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to decide in this time of disorder to allow God to reorder my life. We are going to have to decide if we're going to allow Christ to reorder our church, our country. I freely and heartily Yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. invitation and the challenge, being an out-of-control disciple. Um, so now we'll go into our uh, tithes and offerings. I don't know if y'all can see um, in the comments, there's a, in the, in the description section, there's a link, gracedallas.org slash donate. If you want to click on that, um, yeah, I invite all of y'all to uh, Give your tithes and offerings and see joining God's work of making yeah, making reorder out of out of the disorder of, of our world.
Will you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you that you want to create a new order out of the disorder that is our world. We thank you that you want this even more than we do. And we thank you that you are in the business of renewing our hearts so that we'll want it even more. And we thank you that you are that you invite us in that work. And God, as we work toward this, I I just ask that you bless the the tithes and offerings that have been given. And that you would show us how to use these tithes and offerings better than we ever could for the reordering of the world that you love so much. Thank you, God. I'm here to share with you a prayer practice called Visio Divina in nature. I know a lot of you realize that God speaks to us through nature, and I'm going to talk to you about a four-part prayer pro practice with that. It's called Seeing Divinely. And the first part is for us to uh, choose a part of creation to focus on. I have with me today a plant. I know most of us would like to be out at a national park somewhere or someplace really beautiful and immersive. So one of the things I'm going to suggest is to curb your perfectionism. Because a lot of times we think, oh yeah, this sounds good. I'll do this when, or, or wait until you know, I get to go to the beach or, or the lake. And instead, I want you to practice with this, not only now, but every day this week. And if you're not able to go to the park or, or your garden uh, or to look at your pet, you can look out the window or you can look at a plant or even a photograph. And we'll do that in a moment, a photograph of someplace that reminds us of God's beauty and what it's like to be there. This Visio Divina, has a four part process. The first is to actually see or look and observe all that's in there that then comes together to make a whole. So if we're looking at a tree, we could see from the branches and the leaves and the trunk down to the roots. Also in this part, we observe any noise or silence movements. And we let that offering, that creation, pour over our soul. The second part of this is meditation or focus and thinking. Continue as we observe. How do you feel connected or disconnected? What thoughts or images come to our mind? And do that in a non-judgmental way. Um, there's not a right way to see, and it could be that mainly we feel disconnected, and that's okay. God is with us and speaking to us through all of these things. The third part is to actually talk to God and pray. We can give thanks for that which is before us, this plant, the birds out the window, um, what's growing in our garden. Pray about how is God revealing God's presence to us through creation. Ask how to further and better develop seeing and affirming common good that God created, as it says in Genesis 1, 31. How can we be a part of that? The fourth part, contemplation. In that part, we actually let go of everything. We try to empty our mind and let God fill us with holy silence. You could do that with your eyes closed or open. And if your mind wanders, which they always do, again, don't be judgmental, but focus on our breath. And when we inhale and exhale, we can, again, empty our mind 
Um, so the four parts of this are seeing and looking at what's there. Secondly, focus and thinking. Then talking to God and praying. And then contemplation. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to put a photo up here. Um, and I'm sure most of us have been to a place like this. So this could be something to focus on right now. And if you're really good at, at imagining or memory, you might even hear those waves. But let's spend a few minutes in this practice. And I will give us a, a, few, a few seconds with each part of it and just prompt in between each of those four parts then. So now we are going to see and look, observe, Let's take now time to focus and think. How do we feel connected or disconnected? Thirdly, how is God revealing God's presence through creation? And we can be thankful for that. And now let's spend some time in contemplation and let go of everything by emptying our mind. Let God fill you with holy silence. I hope this prayer practice today is meaningful and I'll write up a summary to post or send in our church newsletter as well. I want to spend the next couple of minutes uh, praying the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, which I think is also very appropriate for all of, all of this that we've heard today and for this practice. And it is, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. Let this be us in the world. And now we have some prayer requests that have been given to us by people through Facebook. So in this part, I'm going to give the request and then I will put my hand out. And after I say, Lord, I want everyone to say, hear our prayer. So 
Lord, for those who are isolated and lonely right now, Lord, hear our prayers. For those who are returning to school, anywhere from preschool through college, teachers, students, and staff, we pray for safety and health, for compliance with the regulations so that everyone can stay safe. And I want God to be with everyone and bring some peace. Lord, hear our prayers. For those who are at home, helping the family learn remotely, helping the kids, be with those parents and give them patience and wisdom and help those children really be able to connect and learn. Help the families be able to balance uh, all the different jobs they have on their plate now. Lord, hear our prayers. I have a prayer for Jackie Grace, Jonathan's mom, whose car was stolen. And I pray that God will help her with that feeling of vulnerability and fear that comes along with any kind of violation like, like this. God, be with Jackie Grace. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for our brother Riley Miller, who's going to have surgery this week. We pray for peace for both Riley and Jamie and for guidance for the medical team. Lord, hear our prayers. A prayer for Miranda's brother, Larry Prater, who is on hospice. Lord, peace for that whole family. Lord, hear our prayers. Barbara asked for a prayer for her friend, Amelia Schmidt, who's having surgery for a brain tumor this week. And we say, Lord, hear our prayers. I also ask that God would use this time to reorder our lives and that we will do so in the pattern of Christ. Lord, hear our prayers. And for the United Methodist Church, that we reorder to draw the circle wider and be led by our LGBTQ plus siblings. Lord, hear our prayers. And Lord, help us to be out of control and reordered by you again. Lord, hear our prayers. Now let's take some time praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, <laughs> thank you, Jacqueline. She's in another part of the church, but we're sorry for any difficulties. Our Wi-Fi seems to be glitchy today, but thank you guys for being steady and staying with us. We're grateful for this time to offer um, blessings uh, for those who have anniversaries and have had also birthdays. I don't think we've seen any birthdays recently, but if you have a birthday, please let us know and we will lift that up. So the anniversaries that we have are Tim and Amy Gill, Mr. and Mrs. Paul Welch, and David and Sonia Ramirez. So will you join me as we offer a blessing for them? Eternal God, we give you thanks for these marriages, these holy covenants that are living, breathing, and seeking to do 
your will and your kingdom. Help watch over them in this next year. Give them patience, joy, growth, and deeper connection with you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, before our benediction, uh, we would certainly want to say thank you to everyone who's participated. Thank you, Sally, for coming and offering your gifts of music. Uh, Thank you, Mark, for helping lead sound. Uh, Thank you, the other Mark, for helping corral your kid. Uh, Janet, thank you for your help. Davis, as always. Jacqueline's over here, and I think that's it. No, I'm kidding. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. So he is going to take it away with the benediction. Thank you. It's so good to be with you today, Grace Church, and I want you to receive this benediction. Will you be an out-of-control disciple? Will you let God remake and reorder your life? Say yes to that, and God will. And go with the Spirit. Go and bear witness the love of God in this world and in you. So those for whom love is a stranger, and there are those for whom love is a stranger, may find in you what we have found, generous friends. Go in peace, and may the peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you. Amen.